it seems to me above all necessary to declare here who and what I am. Ecce Homo is the last book Nietzsche wrote. It followed a period of sustained productivity in the year 1888, during which he wrote four works, The Case of Wagner, Twilight of the Idols, The Antichrist, and Ecce Homo. Unique among Nietzsche's works, this book is an autobiography, but not in a conventional sense. Just how unconventional is the book? Let's take a look at the chapter titles. Why I am so wise. Why I am so clever. Why I write such good books. Why I am a destiny. What is going on in this work? That will be the chief question we're asking ourselves in this series. So strap in and enjoy the ride. It's a wild one. To be notified when other parts come out, please consider subscribing and clicking the bell button. First of all, we need to talk about the title. Nietzsche immediately invokes Christian imagery just like he did with the Antichrist. Ecce homo, which is Latin for behold the man, is a famous phrase uttered by Pontius Pilate during the trial of Jesus. The battered and tortured Jesus, wearing the crown of thorns, is brought before the crowd. Pilate exclaims, Behold the man! And the crowd is relentless, they want Jesus crucified. There's a lot of theological speculation regarding the phrase. What did Pilate really mean by it? What is the significance of the phrase for the gospel in its entirety? One interpretation holds that it's meant to invoke sympathy from the crowd. Before them stands a man, bloody and beaten. A man, not a king, not a god, not the son of a god. Just a man in all his humility and vulnerability. We might say that Nietzsche wants to invoke the same layer of meaning by naming his autobiography Ecce Homo. The man in question, of course, would be Nietzsche himself. But there's a deep sense of irony in the title. Not only did we just look at the chapter titles, which are anything but vulnerable and humble, but there is also the profound sense of irony in the fact that Nietzsche explicitly equates himself with Jesus in the title of this work while he wrote a book called The Antichrist right before this one. So it's just the title. Nietzsche has set the tone for the rest of the book. We should be prepared for irony. Yet we can also approach the title from another angle. What if the Ecce Homo reference isn't simply about Nietzsche ironically equating himself with Jesus, but about Nietzsche trying to say to the world, look at me, here is a man who will be just as important to world history as Jesus Christ was. Now it gets interesting. Now the hyperbolic chapter titles make sense in an unironic way. And as we will see when we go deeper into the contents of the book, there just might be something to this unironic interpretation. This is the first major question that surrounds the work. Just how serious and sincere is Nietzsche really? And in which measure is he just joking or being ironic or being provocative? Or is the hyperbolic style so characteristic of his late work an early symptom of his coming mental collapse? There are arguments to be made for both interpretations. On the one hand, Nietzsche must have known that it's hard to take seriously a chapter titled Why I Write Such Good Books. It could be a regular example of irony, but he could also be parodying the autobiographical style of the 19th century, in which many self-proclaimed geniuses wrote very approvingly of themselves in their own autobiographies. Chief among them would be Richard Wagner, whose multi-volume work about himself is full of praise for himself. And Nietzsche, as proofreader of the work, would be the very first person in the world to have read it and be familiar with it. On the other hand, Nietzsche is brutally honest in this book, especially concerning his own ill health. Why should we think the positive things he says about himself are ironic, while the negative things are sincere? In the very first paragraph of the book, Nietzsche tells us about his ill health, how migraines bother him, how he sometimes loses his eyesight to the point of blindness. He wants us to know how sick, how decadent he is. Having admitted all this, do I need to say that I am experienced in questions of décadence? In fact, Nietzsche claims his own décadence, his own sickness, is precisely what allowed his genius in the first place. The positive claims and the negative claims come together to form one argument. To look upon healthier concepts and values from the standpoint of the sick, and conversely to look down upon the secret work of the instincts of décadence from the standpoint of him who is laden and self-reliant with the richness of life. This has been my longest exercise, my principal experience. If in anything at all, it was in this that I became a master, 
Today, my hand knows the trick. I now have the knack of reversing perspectives. The first reason, perhaps, why a transvaluation of all values has been possible to me alone. If Nietzsche's self-admitted decadence is posited in earnest, while his self-proclaimed genius is only meant to be ironic, would the above passage be possible? Would it even make sense? As we continue our analysis of the book, try to keep in mind this ongoing tension on the irony or sincerity of this work in the back of your head. But don't decide on your perspective just yet. We still have long ways to go. We still have to discuss Nietzsche's goal with this book. It's not just about him writing his own biography. There's much more to it. Just like with the previous discussion on the two words that constitute the title of the work, when we open Pandora's box of trying to figure out what Nietzsche is trying to accomplish with this book, we will find ourselves exploring multiple layers of meaning. Out of my will to health and to life, I made my philosophy. In the previous part, we looked at Ecce Homo mostly as a biography. We saw how Nietzsche praised himself in an extremely hyperbolic way, but we also saw how his brutal honesty concerning his flaws and bad health makes the book a difficult nut to crack. We left open the question of irony. Is Nietzsche being ironic in the work or not? In this part, we will go over the second aspect of Ecce Homo. We will look at the book not as a biography, but as a philosophy. However, viewers who watched our series on Beyond Good and Evil will know that it's not so easy to separate the two. For Nietzsche, biography and philosophy are intimately linked. Every great philosophy up till now has consisted of the confession of its originator and a species of involuntary and unconscious autobiography. In that video, we go more in depth, with the examples of Spinoza and Kant, into what Nietzsche is really saying here. But the main idea is simple. He asserts that the personality of a philosopher will influence his philosophy. In other words, that philosophers are not really these objective, distant, neutral searchers for truth, but rather that they seek to legitimize and justify their personality with a veneer of objectivity, which they then call their philosophy. So, for example, the morose and Norse Schopenhauer arrives at a pessimistic philosophy. Spinoza, the lens-making physicist, creates a system based on logical propositions and axioms. Immanuel Kant, the man who held so close to his daily routine that it is rumored he went for a walk at exactly the same minute of every day, created an ethics based on duty and blind obedience to the categorical imperative. It just so happens that every great philosopher ends up creating a system that seems to justify the personality of its originator. All that Nietzsche really asks in Beyond Good and Evil is, is that really a coincidence? Or were there hidden biases at play when these so-called great philosophers were coming up with their systems? Of course, the answer is yes. One of the questions we could ask Nietzsche is whether or not he himself has any of these unconscious biases that plagued the great philosophers of the past. We don't have to wait long for an answer. In Ecce Homo, Nietzsche makes it clear that his personality cannot be separated from his philosophy. Nietzsche will seek to transparently and obviously embrace his personality when doing philosophy. In doing so, he breaks with the old philosophers, who, according to Nietzsche, have always tried to hide their personality from their work so as to maintain the illusion of objectivity and disinterested truth. So, in Ecce Homo, the line between philosophy and biography becomes blurred. We already touched upon this in part 1, when we discussed how Nietzsche viewed his own sick health as a necessary foundation upon which he built his life-affirming outlook. For this should be thoroughly understood. It was during these years in which my vitality reached its lowest point that I ceased from being a pessimist. The instinct of self-recovery forbade my holding to a philosophy of poverty and desperation. The focus on biography as an underpinning of philosophy also serves another purpose. It provides Nietzsche with ammunition to attack the idea of the Hinterwald. The Hinterwald is a general term for the kind of philosophy or religion Nietzsche attacks throughout his writings. German for behind world, it refers to the idea common in philosophy and religion that this world, the world of the here and now, the material world, is not of supreme importance. The Hinterwald takes many forms. It could be heaven or the kingdom of God as in Christianity, or it could be the thing in itself in the philosophy of Kant or the will in the philosophy of Schopenhauer. It could even be the veil of Maya, the idea in Hinduism that the material world is an illusion. The platonic world of ideas or forms is another example. Nietzsche takes issue with this kind of philosophy, and he sought to make an end to the Hinterwald. 
His philosophy is an invitation for us to live in this world without hope for salvation in the next, and to courageously endure and overcome the struggles of the material world. That is what the will to power is all about. By infusing his philosophy with biography, in other words, by using his own material, temporal life to explicitly justify his philosophy, Nietzsche is stylistically pulling philosophy down from the heavens, so to speak, onto the earth. For Nietzsche, philosophy is not about abstractions and empty theorizing about some world beyond this one. Philosophy is about this life and this world. By injecting his human, earthly experience into his philosophy, Nietzsche is in effect saying no to the hinterwald. He will not tackle philosophy as if he is a ghost without a body, pure reason without emotion. No, he will do philosophy according to the Greek ideal, firmly rooted in material existence and human experience. Ecce Homo is full of reference points to the material world. Entire paragraphs are dedicated to digestion, the need for physical exercise, when to drink tea, the importance of climate, and so on. You get the sense that this work is imminently rooted in the material world. As an example, the first paragraph of the chapter Why I am so clever is entirely about the differences between English, French, German, and Italian cuisine. There's even some dietary advice thrown in. Nothing should be eaten between meals. Coffee should be given up. Coffee makes one gloomy. Tea is beneficial only in the morning. It should be taken in small quantities, but very strong. The precise contents of what is written here are not as important as the overarching idea and style that the material world should reign supreme over the imagined hinterwald. When you start reading a chapter called Why I am so clever, you expect to read something like an intellectual biography. Maybe Nietzsche will tell us which books he has read, at what age, which mental aspects of his personality make him so clever. But the trick Nietzsche pulls is that the entire chapter in which he explains why he is so clever is exclusively talking about physical and not mental considerations. He talks about cuisine, diet, climate, recreation, friendships. He is talking about the real world of things, not the imagined world of ideas. This subversion of expectations is another example of irony in the book, but it's not a humorous kind of irony. Nietzsche has a profound message. These trivial matters, diet, locality, climate, and one's mode of recreation, the whole casuistry of self-love, are inconceivably more important than all that which has hitherto been held in high esteem. It is precisely in this quarter that we must begin to learn afresh. All those things which mankind has valued with such earnestness, heretofore are not even real. They are mere creations of fancy, or, more strictly speaking, lies born of the evil instincts of diseased and, in the deepest sense, noxious natures. All the concepts, God, soul, virtue, sin, beyond, truth, eternal life. In his previous work, The Antichrist, Nietzsche launched a theoretical attack against the Christian worldview, which is filled with such concepts as God, soul, sin, beyond, etc. Now, with Ecce Homo, he puts this theoretical attack in practice. He wants to return philosophy to its roots, philosophy as a mode of living. And life does not exclusively consist in thinking. Life is about drinking, eating, doing sports, growing. In other words, life is about being in the world. And that is precisely what Nietzsche wants philosophy to be, in the world. Philosophy as a way of life and a celebration of life, with his own life as the first example. We'll see how Nietzsche further explores this in the next part. My genius resides in my nostrils. In the previous part, we discussed the recurring theme of physicality in Ecce Homo. Nietzsche wants us to focus on the here and now, away from the idealistic hinterwald. Not only does Nietzsche focus on the outer world, for example by discussing diet or climate, but he also focuses on the inner world. Ecce Homo is full of references to the human body, and most interestingly, the nose. For Nietzsche, the nose is the most underrated of the senses, having received very little interest in philosophy. Yet the sense of smell is perhaps one of the most powerful ones, able to instantly take us back to a memory when we smell a certain aroma. But the nose is also an excellent warning system. It warns us against rotten food, for example. It elicits a reaction of disgust more powerful than mere visuals. Rotten meat looks disgusting, for sure, but have you ever smelled it? Ecce Homo is littered with references to noses and smell. For example, talking about the birth of tragedy, Nietzsche remarks that it smells offensively of Hegel and we instantly know he must not be very proud of this work. He takes the metaphor of smell even further, adding that in some places the book is infected with the bitter odor of corpses, which is peculiar to Schopenhauer. 
And this brings us to the meat of the matter. Nietzsche uses the metaphor of smell in two ways. First, like we said, to bring back attention to our body and to the material world as part of his ongoing struggle against the Hinterwelt. But secondly, he uses smell to illustrate his concept of degeneration. Degeneration, or décadence, is one of the most ubiquitous but also difficult concepts in Nietzsche's philosophy. It can be explained in a short video like this one, but we went deeper into it in our video series on Twilight of the Idols. For the purposes of this video, we must remember that degeneration functions as a sort of catch-all term for Nietzsche's diagnosis of Western culture. Strictly speaking, it refers to a state of decline. Specifically, Nietzsche targets Christian dominance in the West and the philosophies associated with it. There is Platonism, as a sort of precursor to Christianity. There is Kantianism, which in Nietzsche's interpretation is simply Christianity, but in philosophical terms instead of religious ones. And there is Schopenhauer, the philosopher who unwittingly exposed the nihilism upon which Christianity is built. This descent into nihilism is the core of décadence. Nietzsche's entire project can be boiled down to this. Firstly, it's an attack on these decadent philosophies. Actually, it's not even an attack, it's an attempted destruction of them. And secondly, it asks the question, what comes after this destruction? To answer this last question, another one of Nietzsche's difficult concepts surfaces. Dionysian. We have also tackled that concept more in depth, from an aesthetic point of view in our video on Dionysian art. Dionysian is a difficult concept, because it was introduced in the birth of tragedy, but in the joyful science, Nietzsche decides to change the meaning of the term. In his later philosophy, the Dionysian is a catch-all term for everything Nietzsche approves of. Dionysus is the opposite of Jesus Christ, and Dionysian is the opposite of Christian. If our culture is still based on a Christian morality and worldview, then Nietzsche wants us to become Dionysian. If Christianity is the ultimate religion of saying no, then the Dionysian is the ultimate saying of yes. If Christianity is the ultimate religion of the spirit, then the Dionysian is the ultimate philosophy of the body. Someone who would call himself Dionysian would instinctively reject Christianity and Schopenhauer. In fact, the rejection would be so firm, he would be literally disgusted by it. He who not only understands the word Dionysian, but understands himself in that term, does not require any refutation of Plato or of Christianity or of Schopenhauer, for his nose sense decomposition. Let's take a step back and look at the imagery Nietzsche is conjuring up. Nostrils, nose, smell, bitter odor of corpses, decomposition. This is strong language, but that's exactly Nietzsche's point. This is serious business. In a way, Nietzsche's entire philosophy is encapsulated in this extended metaphor. We have the element of decline, or décadence, the descent of philosophy into the hinterwelt, a made-up behind world, in other words, the descent into nihilism. And we have the focus on the body, the first step in Nietzsche's proposed solution. We're going back to the material world, back to the body instead of the spirit, a refocus on the here and now, on this world and on this life. Let's try to see how far we can take this metaphor. If Christianity and Schopenhauer smell rotten, if they are decaying, decadent, degenerated, then what would be the opposite? What would smell good, clean, and fresh? Well, that would be Das spoke Zarathustra, of course. The book Nietzsche calls literally the book of mountain air. Throughout Ece Homo, Nietzsche refers to his own philosophy, specifically to his Zarathustra, to fresh air. He who knows how to breathe in the air of my writings is conscious that it is the air of the heights. You see how the metaphor goes both ways, and this is no accident. It's just one of the many layers of meaning that are scattered throughout Ece Homo, a work that's been criminally underrated in academic philosophy, but a book that's worth reading for anyone who is interested in Nietzsche. Like with all Nietzsche's works, you will understand it better the more of Nietzsche's other works you've read. All of his works are connected and have overarching ideas which are constantly tackled from different angles. To borrow a metaphor from Schopenhauer, Nietzsche's work is like a cathedral with many entrances, but they all lead to the center. With this little series, we hope to provide you with one such entrance into Nietzsche's thought. As you read Ece Homo, try to keep in mind the theme of the body, the nose, the smell, and see if you can uncover layers of meaning that were previously hidden from you. Then, after you've finished it, go read some other books by Nietzsche, and then come back to this one. You will be surprised at how different the experience is. Nietzsche's philosophy is a gift that keeps on giving, and here at the channel, we will try our best to keep providing you with inspiring content to help you on your journey. 
A big shout out to our Patreons who make long form content like this possible. If you want to support the channel, there's a link in the description. Patreons who pledge $10 per month or more will have access to a monthly Patreon exclusive video. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next one. If you want more Nietzsche, we have done in-depth analyses of other works such as The Genealogy of Morals and Twilight of the Idols. Again, thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next one.